Uh, this is a model that was started in Teach for America and the model has been contextualized and replicated in India. And after this replication was successful, we've been able to expand it to 40 countries across all the five continents. Uh, where uh, the fellowship really focuses on is education, inequity in each country. Uh, and how it addresses the issue is by having uh, India's, uh, the country's brightest individuals in classrooms as teachers for a period of two years and in the process of ha giving them that experience also training and developing them to become leaders in the movement in the long run so they teach as teachers for two years in the classroom in low income urban communities and then they go on to work in different pieces of education or the development sector so the key outcomes that we are looking at are twofold one is higher learning outcomes for children who we engage with and second, uh, just building a pipeline of talented, motivated individuals who want to work, like uh, Mr. Gautama said earlier, with a sense of idealism in the development sector. Uh, I'll just quickly move to some of the challenges which we've been successfully able to overcome through replication and some of the challenges we are still facing. Uh, there are three big challenges that we initially faced. One was just training fellows quickly and bringing them up to speed to become a teacher in five weeks time when a typical B. Ed. course takes two to four years, right? Uh, the second uh, was also selecting these people who have the potential to become leaders in the system, right? Because we are looking at a long term horizon and not just a two year cycle. We are not selecting them to become teachers, but for them to have the skills to become leaders and work on the different pieces of the puzzle. So how do we standardize that selection and replicate it consistently across the cities we operate in? And the third one has been just measuring our impact. And when I say measuring impact, it's not just related to academic outcomes, but also how are our classrooms doing on values and mindsets, on the exposure and access that the children are receiving, as well as how are our fellows doing in terms of their own transformation, in terms of the collective action that they are taking towards getting all children a great education and in terms of their understanding of the problem itself. So we've been able to standardize that mechanism in terms of just tracking both the fellows and the classrooms they operate in. Uh, are there any questions at this point that I can answer? Okay. Uh, then I'll move to the challenges that we face uh, with this model right now. One of the biggest challenges in India is uh, recruitment. Uh, get, getting enough, so we select around 7% of the total applicants who apply to our pool. So if we require 1,000 fellows in the coming year, we are approximately looking at 14,000 applications across the country, right? Uh, recruitment becomes a challenge because there is a thriving corporate market in India and it's uh, always a more convenient choice given the low safety net that the Indian economic system offers to its citizens. Uh, the second challenge that we are facing right now, and we haven't really prioritized this, but we've started thinking about it is how do we galvanize those people who have completed the fellowship to work together to have greater impact in the different geographies they are in. And that's a, a piece we are looking at. And the third one, which is a replication ch challenge in terms of just the cyclical nature of the fellowship, uh, is how do we contextualize the solution we are offering to each community we are operating in so that the impact which the fellows can have in their classroom is more enduring and does not, uh, you know, we don't keep reinventing the wheel every time a new fellow comes in, in terms of just building those relationships with the community itself. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So, <coughs> you know, you have a very powerful story of scale, right? I mean, you know, so you said there are a couple of things which you have done well and seems to be reasonably happy about it. So tell us a little bit about it, you know, in terms of saying that you said measuring impact, right? And, and both for fellows as well as for children. So yeah. what are you doing there? Can you just take us Sure. So for measuring impact, I think one of the distinctions that I could make from the presentations earlier and with us is that we have people who are working within the organization at the point of impact all the time, right? So our fellows actually are in the classroom and are helping us measure those inputs. So we measure student outcomes using standardized assessments uh, in literacy and numeracy. 
Uh, we also measure outcomes on values and mindsets uh, through a speaking and listening assessment where we ask students about what their values are, giving us examples of what they've seen around them, where they've seen them play out. So that's the other assessment bit. We've also created standardized scales that measure outcomes of where students are in terms of all the three buckets that we work in. So we break academics into one, what is the culture like in the classroom? Do the stu are the students joyful and passionate? They, do they really want to achieve outcomes on their own? And the amount of rigor which the teacher is able to bring into the class so that students are not just uh, receivers of knowledge, but they are creating knowledge for others in their classroom. Uh, so there's a whole scale for that. We've also created a similar scale to measure values and mindsets in the classroom as well as educational uh, uh, sorry, in, as well as exposure and access. For the fellows, again, we've created a scale uh, which is based on a lot of research that we've done across countries where we've identified what are the key traits that build a strong leader and then through the, an evaluation by their program managers, uh, we, get, uh, we agree on a rating for each fellow as to where they are on the different pieces towards their journey of becoming leaders. Uh, in addition, we've also been able to create a system of capturing bright spots and amplifying them across the network uh, very well and that happens locally as well at different levels in terms of collaborative spaces where people come together and share these stories with each other. So uh, development is a twofold thing so we want to develop them as a teacher and we want to develop them as a leader and those of us who've done the fellowship earlier will agree that we focus a lot more on teaching than leadership. Uh, during those two years and the leadership came more coincidentally because of what we experienced in our classrooms but I think over a period of time the system has evolved significantly. How we break down training is one we have a five week full time residential training uh, which is highly structured and uh, has been replicated successfully in ev ev every year as a new cohort comes in and then we have ongoing support which is one key piece which teachers in the existing government system lack where uh, fellows uh, engage with each other in collaborative spaces called learning circles to learn from each other and these are facilitated by program <coughs> managers where they get both technical skills as well as the leadership skills that they require to move ahead on this journey. Um, how much of uh, Teach for America is based on replicated and what was customized? Sure. So, in terms of what was replicated from Teach for America, we did follow the fellowship model which Teach for America does. But the key difference here was that Teach for America places fellows in a classroom for two years but does not continue with that set of kids in the future. What Teach for India did was said that hey we want to ensure that these kids are on a different life path. So we have fellows in those classrooms from one cycle to the next cycle so that as kids keep moving from grade 2 to grade 10, they also keep having a deeper, we keep having a deeper and deeper impact on them. So that was one big difference. I think the other big difference uh, between Teach for America and the Teach for India model is just uh, that Teach for America's alumni movement has been more coincidental and it has started over 25 years. So it's more like a standard alumni movement which any great institution would have once people reach certain positions. In Teach for India, we are trying to get accelerate ourselves much faster because we know that an alumnus can have a far wider and deeper impact on people rather than uh, on children than a fellow in a classroom who impacts 35 to 40 kids. So we are thinking much more consciously about it and trying to systemize creation of that network. The standard assessment set you have, to measure outcomes and for students as well as how fellows are doing. What part of it is, like, how much of it is quantitative versus qualitative and how do you marry both and... So the standardized assessments are fully quantitative in terms of the outcomes. So we have outcomes by student, by year. Uh, the other ones where we measure where they are doing on <coughs> moving towards our vision for our students as well as where they are doing on their commitments to become a stronger leader is more, is again quantified but the discussion to agree on those numbers is more qualitative. So how do you ensure that the qualitative is not left out, you know, in the, especially in the student learning outcomes? So the qualitative is not left out in the sense that we, when we are measuring them on the uh, student vision scale 
I think what we do is we create a fellow portfolio for each person who is a part of the fellowship. And what we do in the process is keep gathering those evidences that make us say that, hey, this person is on a three on five in terms of his classroom vision outcome because he has done these, these, these things. Right? So we are gathering these evidences simultaneously all the time. So I could see Navya smile when you ask that question. And often I think the challenge is the other way around where fellows say they receive excessive feedback uh, in their development, which is also a reason why they grow so quickly through the two years. So we have a program managers allocated to 15 people and program managers are people who have had like a high quality instructional experience in their own teaching stints and who have been fully, uh, uh, who fully uh, absorbed the Teach for India training model as well. So they are highly skilled. Uh, they observe the fellow at least once in two weeks, giving them specific feedback on what they are doing in the classroom and what they are not doing. Periodically, they have conversations around their leadership development as well, so that they build a greater clarity of what their personal vision is going to look like and what is the role they want to play in ensuring that uh, the under-resourced in India are receiving the right outcome in the future. So it's a mix of both and the program managers play a key role. In addition, we have other structures that run at a city level as well as nationally where we bring people together to give them a chance to share their learnings with each other as well as receive feedback on the work they are doing. So, uh, is reading a part of the work of uh, yes. the fellows? Do they get some reading material? Do they get some uh, for their own growth? As so, well? they do get a lot of reading material. Not but on the subjects. No, I'm not talking no it's. It's barely about the subject. Our focus is more on pedagogy in the classroom. But we also push fellows because we believe each individual's needs are very different. I think what the role program managers have started playing now is playing the role of a connector, saying that this is a great source for a resource. Go find out yourselves because we believe that once they move out of the fellowship and they are in the real world, which we call the ocean, they'll have to fend for themselves. Right? So how do you guide them to the right resources but do not spoon feed them all the time? That's been our focus area. Uh, I just have a follow up to that. Uh, the, the pedagogy that you're talking about, right? there's a lot of organizations uh, across India that have worked uh, in different areas that they've there's developed no, this. Uh, there's a lot of organizations uh, working in the education space in India <coughs> for decades, right? who have developed this kind of pedagogy already. So how much of that have you absorbed rather than created yourself? Like how much of that replication has happened from outside to into Teach for India? Sure, so I think uh, Teach for India is like a sister concern of Akansha, which has worked for the last 25 years and it's run by the same person, Shaheen Mistri, uh, who started the movement. So I think Shaheen has, Akansha has been our partner in helping us with the initial stages of the curriculum. We've also had a lot of inputs from our partner countries, uh, whether it's Teach for America or Teach First UK, in terms of some of the practices which they have used in the classroom, which they have seen work. Our larger challenge is to contextualize it to the needs of our kids, which is where our training and impact team plays a larger role. Uh, also, the other focus that we brought in on values and mindsets and exposure and access is not something which you see in typical curriculum. So how do we bring a larger focus on that is where Teach for India has had a lot of in-house learning. Uh, I wanted to bring up uh, one of the challenges you brought up was how you, you know, the, the process of recruitment. Uh, I think a lot of us on this side, like, you know, we are students and we constantly face that choice whenever we graduate and we, you know, want to move into the industry. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, you know, two years, uh, so when students pass out of colleges, two years is, at the end of the day, a huge commitment. Um, so uh, is there a way that, have you thought of replicating this process within sort of existing systems? Uh, like, is there a way where you can go into the existing corporate space or the existing university space and, and maybe um, the students can teach uh, on a voluntary basis? So they might not be fellows for two years, but they're still sort of engaged in this methodology of getting trained and, and teaching students, uh, and somehow hope that that motivates uh, them to take this up further. You know. So is there is there an idea to uh, sort of replicate this in existing spaces? Sure. So while I say recruitment is a challenge, but recruitment as a process is highly evolved within the organization itself. 
So we have a group of corporate as well as college recruiters that work full time on this. We also have a group of campus <coughs> leaders from those spaces who actually identify high potential candidates and try investing them in the work that we do through volunteering exercises, <coughs> through sharing information with them, uh, by making them engage with fellows and forums at, uh, at these spaces itself. Uh, so that's something which we've done as of now. Uh, to your question of whether we are okay with people just volunteering and then providing them support, uh, we don't believe in that model because we believe that people need to immerse themselves in the reality of children to really see what it takes to make a difference. Because as a volunteer, it's probably easier for you to go in for on one day and do this, but for you to do this day after day is a real challenge and that's where the real learning lies. So we don't encourage so we don't provide the same kind of support to volunteers as we do to our fellows in the system. There's also a huge cost associated with the support that we provide. Uh, and also reaching out to people as well? So, to try and get them to apply? So we look at two channels largely. One is corporates and one is campuses, like educational institutions. Uh, and, uh, but do these guys, I mean, I don't know, where do the teachers have to go to rural areas? No. So, that's one of the uh, things about our model that it's largely urban because of the nature of intensive support that it requires. So it doesn't operate in a remote setting because the whole learning experience is based on people coming together in very short frequencies so that their growth can be faster. So we don't uh, go to rural as of now. <coughs> yeah. So we have both. There are people who quit their roles and join us as fellows and there are people who take sabbaticals for two years and work with us. Uh, just to give you a context, our youngest fellow in the system is 20 years old and our oldest fellow is 63 years old. So there's this whole spectrum of people who join us from different walks of life. So uh, our arrangements with their organizations are different on different points. Have you considered starting pilot schools? So we haven't done that and I was just discussing this with Ulas earlier today where our alumni have done that successfully. So we have around four schools that our alumni have started in Pune uh, right now. We have these are, urban. these are urban but we have two schools, one started in Shillong and one started in, in the interior parts of Maharashtra which are rural as well. Does Teach for India ever kind of impart that knowledge to existing NGOs in this space? Or yeah. is there any consideration for replication for rural areas? So uh, we are open to sharing our learning. So whenever anyone reaches out to us, and that's what a lot of alumni organizations do, they reach out to the existing system and we connect them with the right resources as well as people who could guide them in the process. Uh, at the same time, we conduct a conference called Inspired where we welcome organizations from different forays to be a part of and in the process share a lot of learning with each other. So we've conducted these conferences in Bombay, Pune, Delhi and Hyderabad so far. About the course curriculum you offer during the span of two years, whether it is like a specific course which you offer or is it like, you know, evolved with time or you have added some more, you know, coming up environmental issues or something, like whether it is participatory so the curric since we don't run our own schools, the curriculum that we teach is largely the curriculum that that school follows. So if we operate in Bangalore, we operate with the state curriculum itself. And in Maharashtra, we operate with their state curriculum. What we do is try and adapt, uh, make it more skill based. So there is a set of skills that we develop in our curriculum and we try and adapt that curriculum to the skills we are focusing on. Yes, it's largely in English medium in most cities because we recruit from people of backgrounds who studied in English are, and are more fluent in it. Uh, at the same time, we've had some successes. For example, Bangalore right now, we operate with a dual language 
where there is a Kannada language teacher who is also teaching the children Kannada and environmental studies and we have a fellow who is teaching in English, uh, maths uh, and literacy. So, we your own fellows who? Yeah. No, our own fellows. I think we don't have the organizational expertise to create content in so many languages as well as being able to track its effectiveness in the classroom. Thank you so much, Kapil. Thank you. Uh, so